Welcome back to the second part of class one. And we're picking up at John 317. And it reads, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's 2 Peter 3, 9. Repentance is acknowledging that you have been bitten by the serpent and you want to live. You want to turn your life around. Going on to verse 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. For those that hear the gospel and reject it, these are sentencing themselves to hell. The world is already condemned, but God gives mankind a chance. So the question always arises, what about those who have never heard? And this could be a long subject, but let us summarize it like this. God knows what the man will do with the truth. The greatest judgment comes upon those that hear and then reject. Jesus contrasts Capernaum with Sodom and Gomorrah in Matthew 11, 20 through 24. In essence, Jesus said that it would be better for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for Capernaum. The point that Christ was making was that it would be better not to hear than to hear and reject. So we have to deduce from those statements, which are repeated a few times, that it is God's mercy to leave certain people or nations in the dark. He knows what they will do with the truth and he is sparing them from a more severe judgment in eternity. Okay, in verse 19, John 3, 19, and this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Why do men refuse the light? Because they do not want their deeds exposed. They don't want to change. But in verse 29, it says, but he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Those who love truth allow God to circumcise their hearts and people see their good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. Okay, now we're moving into another geographical terrain and we're moving up into Judea. And so in verse 22, after these things, came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea. And there he tarried with them and baptized. And John also was baptizing, John the Baptist, in Anon, near to Salem, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. For John was not yet cast into prison. Actually, Jesus did not personally baptize anybody outside of his own disciples. His disciples baptized those who believed in Christ. Thus, we have two different baptisms going on at the same time. John is baptizing in one area, and of course, uh, Jesus' disciples were also baptizing. But of course, John has to be set aside to give Christ the preeminence. In verse 25, then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. So again, 
there's two baptisms going on simultaneously. And it seemed to provoke some questions. As we pointed out a little earlier, even the Jews baptized proselytes. Uh, John really had to fade out of the picture here because as you can see, it was causing a little controversy. And they were saying, all men are coming to him. All men are coming to Christ. So John's response was this in verse 27. John answered and said, a man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. So John is acknowledging that Christ is greater than he is and that he is simply a forerunner. He is playing second place, second fiddle as it were. Christ could not do what he is doing unless it was given him from heaven. In verse 29, he that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. So John acknowledges Christ as the bridegroom, and he himself as a friend of the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom does not have the preeminence. He is simply there to attend to the needs of the bridegroom, or to assist, or to minister to the needs of the bridegroom. Going on to verse 30, John said, He must increase, but I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. Now, John knew that he had to fade out of the picture. He must increase, but I must decrease. He is from above. I am of the earth. And going on into verse 32, and what he hath seen and heard, that he testifieth, and no man receiveth his testimony. Christ did not speak as the Pharisees. Well, we think this, or it is believed, or we have heard, or it has been said. Christ spoke with authority because he had witnessed these things in the Spirit. Christ could see into the unseen world. Verse 33. He that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth not the spirit by measure unto him. To believe Christ is to believe God the Father. Christ had an open heaven and only spoke on behalf of the Father. John 14, 10. Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Christ means the anointed one. There was no measure to his anointing. It was an infinite anointing that came upon Christ in the Jordan. This anointing is symbolized by the seven candlesticks. And in the tabernacle, the candlestick has no measurement. So the anointing that came upon Christ in the Jordan is explained to us in Isaiah chapter 11. So we're looking at chapter 11 for a minute, and considering the anointing that came upon Christ, Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 1, and it says, um, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch, capital B, shall 
grow out of his roots. And that's, this is also quoted in Romans 15, 12. In verse two, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel, and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. The spirit of the Lord is the anointing to preach. And we can see peculiar anointings that were given to various individuals in scripture. For example, Solomon had the anointing of wisdom. Jonah had the anointing to preach. Samson had the spirit of might. Samuel had the spirit of the fear of the Lord upon him. Dan Daniel had the spirit of knowledge and understanding and counsel. The thing is that these men had these anointings by measure. However, there was no measure to the anointing that came upon Christ. It was given to him without measure. So just to give us a little picture of the, the anointing upon Christ. Uh, continuing in verse 35, now we're back in John 3.35. The father loveth the son and hath given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son hath ever left everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. The Father hath given all things into his hand, even to lay his life down and to take it up again. That's a quote from John 10, 18. He that believeth committeth his life to Christ hath everlasting life. He that believeth not is lost. And that is the bottom line. And that is the end of chapter three. And so now we're moving on to chapter four. And just to give you a little preview of this chapter. In chapter four, we find Quite a long narrative concerning Jesus' short stop in Samaria. Jesus was on his way to Galilee, which is actually north of Samaria. And it is here in Samaria that Christ encounters a woman at the well. This is actually quite a well-known story. There are even songs written about the woman at the well. <clears throat> What we need to understand about Samaria is that it was a place that was very despised by the rigid, sanctimonious Jews of Judea. When the northern kingdom, that is the 10 northern tribes, fell to the Assyrians back in 722 BC, the Assyrians transported people from other conquered lands into Samaria. They took people out, brought people in. But they deported people out of Samaria, imported foreigners into Samaria. And they did this to discourage any further uprisings, language barriers, and so forth. Thus, Samaria was a mixture of Jews with other nations and other religions and so on. Many of the Jews later intermarried intermingled with the foreigners. So the Samaritans were quite a mixture. In fact, so much so that the Jews of Jerusalem refused to let them worship at the temple in Jerusalem. And thus the Samaritans built another temple upon Mount Gerizim where they worshiped. After Jerusalem fell, in 586 BC, many of the Samaritans infiltrated into Judea. So when the Jews returned from Babylon and attempted to rebuild the temple there in Jerusalem, many of the aliens, Samaritans, 
offered to help them build the temple. And just for references, you could look at Ezra chapter four, verse one and two. But of course, the governor, Zerubbabel, did not accept their offer. And thus, these aliens sought to hinder them from building. And this is repeated again in 444 BC, when the Samaritans and aliens tried to hinder Nehemiah from rebuilding the wall. So long story short, the Jews hated the Samaritans and had no dealings with them. So this gives us a little backdrop to the narrative in chapter four. And also in chapter four, we see the second sign miracle performed. Okay, picking up in verse one. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. As you mentioned, Samaria was the province beneath Galilee. Verse five. Then cometh he to the city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. Now, Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. So in Jewish time, it was about 12 noon. It was hot. Jesus was wearied from his journey, and he's resting at the city well. In verse 11, the well is mentioned as being very deep. In fact, the well is still there and said to be over 100 feet deep. Going on to verse 7. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, give me to drink. Now, several observations here. First, it is apparent that those who drew water from the well had to supply their own rope or cord to draw with. Also, it has to be observed that this woman was coming at an off time to draw water, which means that she must have been ostracized, not accepted by the other women because often the women would congregate at the well and you know converse and carry on. But this woman was kind of ostracized from the society here. In verse eight, it says that Jesus' disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, how is it that thou being a Jew asketh drink of me, which I'm a woman of Samaria, for the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So we covered this in the introduction. There was definitely a social, spiritual clash between these two groups. In verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto her, if thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink. Thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou this living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself? his children, and his cattle. If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink. Like Nicodemus, her spiritual understanding was very dull. 
the well is deep, you have nothing to draw with, how can you give me living water? Jesus was telling this woman in a very clever way who he was because he was indeed the fountain of living water as mentioned in Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 13. Salvation is a gift from God and the water of salvation is free to all who will accept. In fact, the very last invitation of the Bible, Revelation 22, 17, is an invitation to all who thirst for life. Going on, well, actually looking at Revelation 22, 17, um, it says, and the spirit and the bride say, come, let him that heareth say, come, let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. It's a free gift. Salvation is a wonderful gift. We don't want to reject it. Okay, back to John. John 4.13. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into eternal life. What Jesus is speaking is in relation to the spiritual man. The physical man needs water to stay alive. The spiritual man needs a spiritual drink to stay alive. The whole world is seeking for something to satisfy a longing and a thirst within. Most of them do not realize that it can only be satisfied in one place. And this is why the Apostle Paul prayed for the Ephesians to have the eyes of their understanding opened. It's Ephesians 1.18. Even Christians that have never experienced the baptism in the Holy Spirit have a certain dullness to spiritual truths. In the Old Testament, even in the Old Testament, Christ is compared to a fountain of living water. And you can find that, I already mentioned that, but in Jeremiah 2.13, you can find that. But going on to John 4, 15, the woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water, that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. So this woman still does not comprehend what Jesus is saying. Now, I had a dream many years ago where I was drinking from the well of salvation. I pressed my lips to the water. It was so good. It was so refreshing, so cool. And that dream has never left me. It was a wonderful thing, but it was kind of a revelation that God was given to me at the time. Going on here to John 4, 16. Jesus saith unto her, go call thy husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou hast now is not thy husband, and that thou saidst truly. And of course, Jesus had the spirit of knowledge. Here's one of the anointings manifested here. And he knew everything about her. This little narrative gives us a picture of many trying to find satisfaction, but finding none. This woman was trying to find satisfaction through human relationships, which all came up empty. So the woman responds in verse 19. The woman saith unto him, Sir, 
I perceive that thou art a prophet. It is amazing how a word of knowledge or a prophetic word can open up one's spiritual being. My wife did not believe in Pentecost until an evangelist spoke such a clear word of knowledge into her life that she was convinced it changed your life forever. Okay, so she continues here in verse 20. She says, our fathers worshiped in this mountain, Mount Gerizim, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Now, actually, well, we'll skip that part. We don't want to get into the restoration era, but the Jews, of course, claimed the temple in Jerusalem. But Jesus responds to her, Woman, believe me, verse 21, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Now, at the time, salvation was only offered unto Abraham's seed or to those that proselyted in such as Ruth a good example of one that came from Gentile world into the kingdom and she came to know the God of Israel verse 23 but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the father in spirit and in truth for the father seed such to worship him. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So what Jesus was saying was that the time would come when men would not have to come to a geographical place to have their worship accepted. The Jews could not offer their sacrifice in just any place. They could only offer it at Jerusalem. In the church age, men are free to worship God in any place, to worship in spirit and in truth. To worship in spirit, one must be filled with the spirit, baptized in the Holy Spirit. And also, God wants worship from the heart, true worship, not the sham worship of the Pharisee. So God wants us to worship in truth, that we're true. Our life is true. We are people that adhere to the teachings of Christ. Okay, going on to John 4, 25. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Now, aside from the disciples, I don't think that there is another place in scripture where Christ actually says to a person, I am Christ, or I'm the Messiah. And yet Christ reveals himself to an outcast. Verse 27. And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the women. Yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? The disciples marveled that Christ condescended to converse with the Samaritan and to a woman of dubious character. Yet, because of their respect for Christ, they did not question his intentions. Going on to verse 28. The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, Come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. Now, this woman was actually the means of bringing many to Christ. 
sometimes the transformation of a person known to be a sinner has a great effect upon people knowing what she had been and and her life is actually the means of bringing many to salvation in verse 31 in the meanwhile his disciples prayed him saying master eat but he said unto them i have meat to eat that you know not of therefore said the disciples one to another hath any man brought him to ought to eat and once again we need to have our spiritual understanding illuminated Jesus often spoke in spiritual terms that didn't make sense to the natural man. As the Apostle Paul said, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit because they can only be discerned by the Spirit. That's 1 Corinthians 2.14. So Jesus explains. Verse 34. Jesus saith unto them, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Even perhaps in miracles. And so that satisfies something that even natural food cannot. John 4.35. Say not ye, there are yet four months and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes. And look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Now, there are spiritual seasons. There are times when people, cities or nations are ripe for revival. This was God's time to move. It's amazing how that geography has a lot to do with things. In one area of the world, things could be ripe for harvest. In another area, it could be dead. And we want to be sensitive to God's timing of things. Oftentimes, when we travel, we see God doing wonderful things in other places. And then we come home and things are dead spiritually. In our church, we try to broadcast our message on YouTube. And I remember a particular service when I was preaching on healing. This was a few years back. I had people come up afterward and prayed for people and nothing happened. However, people that were listening to that message overseas later reported back that many were healed through the message. Amazing how that geography really has there are spiritual powers that dominate certain areas, so another subject. John 4, 36. He that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true. One soweth and another reapeth. And oftentimes... People who labor and have sown the seed do not see a lot of fruit. Others come later and it's harvest time and they see much fruit gathered in. There would not be a harvest if some had not invested their lives sowing the seed. Do you see what Jesus is saying? The time will come when everything is tallied up and the sower, the evangelist, and the reaper will rejoice and be rewarded together. As the Apostle Paul said, 1 Corinthians 3, 8. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor, his own investment. And coming back to Jesus' disciples in verse 38, I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men have labored, 
the year entered into their labors. Verse 39, and many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, he told me all that I ever did. Verse 40, so when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. Do you see the Samaritans, the Samaritan woman's testimony had provoked a revival in Samaria. And many believed when they heard Christ. Verse 42. And they said unto the woman, now we believe, not because of thy saying, for, for we have heard him ourselves and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. It's amazing how God can do great things in a short time. When the atmosphere is ripe, God can do tremendous things in just a short time. Okay, now we're moving into Galilee, and there was just a short stand up in Galilee. And so we go on to verse 43, 44. Now, after two days, he departed thence and went into Galilee. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet hath no honor in his own country. Of course, Jesus was from Galilee. It is uh, amazing that the Jews in Jerusalem rejected Christ. And the rejected Samaritans received Christ. Verse 45. Then when he was coming to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem at the feast, for they also went up unto the feast. So let us consider Galilee for a moment. Galilee was also mixed with other nations. In fact, Isaiah calls it Galilee of the nations. And if you'd like a reference on that, you could note Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 1. It was called Galilee of the nations because same story up in Galilee as Samaria. And you could note 2 Kings chapter 15 and verse 29. In this account, Tiglath-Pileser the Assyrian carried off many captives from Galilee. And as the custom was, they brought other nations into their conquered lands. However, Galilee was home to many devout Jews. Now, Josephus, who's a historian, describes the Galilean temperament as being devout and resolute about their beliefs. And yet, they had the ability to flex. If they could be convinced of something, they had the ability to change their mind. So also the Galileans, I mean, that's a wonderful thing, to be able to change. If you can be shown a better way and to change your mind, that's a wonderful characteristic. The Galileans also had a distinct dialect like the Scots or the Irish, uh, they had a recognizable brogue. And Jesus himself must have had a recognizable dialect. Interestingly, all the disciples that Jesus picked were Galileans. They were, as Jesus described, new wineskins. They could Flex. They could change. Whereas the Judeans were old wineskins, rigid and stiff, and could never adjust to the new wine or the new truth. I mean, if you put new wine in an old wineskin, it would ferment and break the wineskin. And the Judeans were very rigid 
and no flex to them at all. So all of those in the upper room were Galileans and Jesus influenced many in Galilee, except of course, in his hometown of Nazareth. There was a special promise concerning Galilee. And this is also mentioned in Isaiah nine. It says in Isaiah nine that the people who walked in darkness would see great light. And this is also mentioned again in Matthew 4.16. Of course, the great light was Christ. Okay, continuing now in John 4.46. So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. Now, Capernaum was a city in Galilee province. In verse 47. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Capernaum was a very worldly place. Jesus uh, later describes Capernaum as being exalted unto heaven. They were renowned for the prosperity and, and the privilege. In fact, uh, just quoting from Matthew eleven twenty three, 23, Jesus said, and thou Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained unto this day. Back to John 4, verse 48. Then Jesus, uh, then said Jesus unto them, except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The noble, the nobleman saith unto him, sir, come down ere my child die. Jesus saith unto him, go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, thy son liveth and himself believed in his whole house. It really is amazing how that a miracle can turn the hearts of people and we really need to see the miraculous in these last days in order to convince an ungodly generation. And I think we should pray that way, seek God for a release of the miraculous because that opens up a platform for us to speak. Jesus had done many miracles, miraculous acts of power, but this is, uh, is described as the second sign that Jesus performed. So what do we want to read into this? Well, consider Capernaum again. Here's a worldly place, place that offers every vice and enticement and allurement that could ensnare young people. And the nobleman's son had been taken in. He's spiritually dying. And we're spiritualizing on this. He's caught up with the worldly crowd. And many parents today face the same dilemma. They've tried to bring their children up the right way. They've taught them good principles. But they've been sucked in through the internet, wrong associations. They're spiritually dying. 
but this miracle tells us that there is hope for our sons and daughters that are dying in the world. When the nobleman met with Christ, he was given a promise that his son would live. Amen. Okay, continuing now in chapter five. And as we mentioned in our introduction, Jesus fulfilled all the symbolism of all the tabernacle furniture. In chapter five, we see Christ fulfilling the symbolism of the mercy seat. I will have mercy upon whom I will have mercy. So Jesus comes now to Bethesda, which means house of mercy. And he singles out one person from the multitude and heals him. Also in chapter five, Jesus demonstrates the true meaning of the Sabbath. My father works and I work. Jesus was in perfect sync with heaven. Jesus also brings the religious people to grips with the truths concerning the resurrection and the judgment. So, we're in chapter 5 and verse 1, and it says, After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Because of the time sequence, most commentators assume this to be the feast of the Passover, which would make this the second Passover during the ministry of Christ. Okay, John 5, 2. Now, there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pole, which is called in the Hebrew tongue, Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. Now, several things here. The sheep gate was the first gate to be repaired during the wall restoration of Nehemiah. The 10 gates in this restoration project all convey a spiritual message. The sheep gate speaks of salvation. And sequentially, this has to be the first truth that the church understands. Now, notice here that there's a great multitude of impotent, helpless people lying at this gate. Spiritually, this gives us a little picture of people that never progress past the salvation message. In verse 4, for an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. You can understand why this place is called Bethesda, the house of mercy. And also take note that there were five porches. Now, five in the word of God speaks of grace. Thus, at a certain time, an angel of healing troubles the water, and the first one in is made whole. So the Lord shows mercy to whom he will and is gracious to whom he will. And we're just quoting actually from Exodus thirty-three nineteen, 19, where the Lord says that, that he would be gracious to whom he would and have mercy upon whom he would. Going on to verse five, John five, five. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity 30 and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man said unto him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I'm coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise. Take up thy bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was his Sabbath. 
again, we must note that every miracle recorded in John is translated to mean sign. So the emphasis was not on the act of power as much as the message that was being conveyed. Now, as we pointed out, Jesus was fulfilling the symbolism of the tabernacle furniture throughout this gospel. Jesus singles out one man to whom mercy is shown. Theoretically, Jesus could have healed everyone there. And actually, there were times when Jesus healed all that were present. But now he's fulfilling the message conveyed by the mercy seat. I will have mercy upon whom I will have mercy. The mercy seat is solid gold. And gold in the word of God speaks of divinity. God has an absolute reason why he shows mercy to some and not to others. Even as far as sickness or disease, God has a reason for healing some and not others. One girl testified that she had to remain in a wheelchair because she knew that if she had her liberty, she could not be trusted. And then, of course, timing could also enter into the mix. Going on to verse 10, 510. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, it is a Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. He answered them, well, he that made me whole, the same said unto me, take up thy bed and walk. You see, these hypocritical Jews were more concerned with legality than humanity. Jesus said in another place, if your ass or your sheep fall into a pit on a Sabbath day, you would immediately pull them out. Even when Jesus was hanging on the cross, the main concern of the religious leaders was that Jesus was defiling their holy day. They were citing Deuteronomy 21, 22, 23. The Jews were more concerned about rules and legality than they were about the one who gave the rules. The one who gave them the law was hanging on the cross. Going on to verse 12. Then asked they him, what man is that which said unto thee, take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed was not who it was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. Now, here's another very important point. This man had been in his private wilderness for 38 years. And it was a judgment. Jesus warns him to cease from sin, lest the worst plague come upon him. And this is important because, as we shall see later, there are other others that had infirmity that had not sinned. And this man, it was a judgment, and he'd been there a long time. And so... In his case, it was a judgment. Okay, going on to verse 15. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. Now, Jesus is going to give them another view of the Sabbath. Remember, Sabbath means cessation. So Jesus says in verse 17, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, 
because he had not only broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the son likewise. For the father loveth the son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. So, the true Sabbath is the cessation from the works of the flesh. When Jesus came up from his baptism in the Jordan, the heavens were opened unto him. See this in Matthew 3.16. Jesus had an open heaven from his baptism right to the cross. Of course, when he was on the cross, the heavens closed again. And what Jesus was saying was that he doesn't do anything on his own. He was in perfect sync with heaven. Whatever he saw the Father do in heaven, he duplicated it upon earth. He was in that perfect rest. Christ was not moving in the flesh. There was no sweat, no shouting, no demanding. Christ simply spoke and it was done. The point is, when we're moving in God, we're in the rest. And God is doing the work. It is like the disciples who were commanded to cross over the Lake of Galilee. You know, they had been commissioned. They had encountered strong winds. They were toiling and rowing. It says they were putting a lot of sweat into the oar until Jesus came on the scene. When Jesus stepped into the boat, they were immediately at land. So when, when Christ is with us, there's a rest. And that is a picture of the true Sabbath. We're in that rest. There's no sweat. We're, he's working in us. Well, the Jews also sought to kill Jesus because he claimed that God was his father, making himself like God which indeed he was the full expression of God the Father. Let's move into another thought here. And we're now looking at the resurrection and the judgment. And so going on to verse 21, Jesus said, For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. So Jesus Christ, the Son, moves in perfect harmony with his Father. Christ not only quickens us at salvation, but he shall also quicken us in the resurrection. Christ has also been given the throne of judgment. It is Christ who sits upon the white throne at the final judgment in Revelation 20, 11. And so all who have ever lived will stand before Christ at the great white throne judgment, excluding those who had a part of the first resurrection. And if you would like a reference on that, you could put 2 Corinthians 5.10. Or Matthew 25, 31. In 2 Corinthians 5, 10, it says that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Okay, going back to John 5, 23. Jesus said that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father which has sent him. Now, many 
people claim to honor God. Many religions claim to honor God. But God the Father will only accept them through the person of his son. We can only honor God the Father as we come through his son. Verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they shall live. Now, let me just say this. If we do not hear the voice of the Son of God now, he speaks to us spiritually. He awakens us. If we're not quickened by his word now, then we shall not be quickened by his word in the resurrection. That is the resurrection of life and specifically the first resurrection. We want to have part in the first resurrection or we want to be caught up at that time when the Lord returns. In Romans 8.11, it says, But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. So we want to have the spirit of God dwelling within us. That's what sets us apart, sanctifies us. That's what makes us saved. We have the Spirit of God living in us. We hear his word, we respond. Going back to John 5, 26. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. Jesus later makes a statement, I have power to lay down my life and to take it up again. That's from John 10, 18. John 5, 28. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation christ because of his son of man position knows what is in the heart of men because he became a man christ was not just deity, but he became flesh and blood. And notice that there is a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. All will stand bodily before the throne of God and give account. John 530. I can do nothing of myself. Uh, of myself, I do nothing as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. So God the Father bears witness of Christ even through his works. And Jesus said this, I mean, everything that Jesus did was an outflow and an outreach of God the Father. It was God the Father in Christ doing these things. In John 14, 11, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works sake. I mean, people do not just walk around doing supernatural miracles. That power is coming from a source outside of the human realm. 
and of course many of the Pharisees said that this was that Christ was doing these miracles by the prince of devils. Well, we cannot always evaluate people by miracles, but we can by their fruit. Okay, let's go on here. 533. Ye sent unto John, this is John the Baptist, and he bear witness unto the truth. But I receive not testimony from man, but these things I say that ye might be saved. He was a burning and a shining light, and ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. But I have a greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. So John was a burning and shining light for a season. However, John's light had to diminish to make way for the greater light. The light that was upon Christ actually increased as he approached the end of his ministry. There was even a greater recognition given to him on the Mount of Transfiguration. So there was actually an increasing of the anointing right up until the end. John 5, 37. And the Father himself, which has sent me, hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. And ye have not his word abiding in you, for whom he hath sent him ye believe not. If you take a look at some of Christ's parables, they were quite revealing concerning a nation that would reject the Son. For example, the parable of the vineyard or the wicked husbandman. Israel as a nation did not have the word abiding in their hearts. If they had, they would have recognized Christ as the author of Hebrews said, in the volume of the book, it is written of me. Quoting from Hebrews 10, 7, and also from the Psalms. The whole book testifies of Christ. The whole Bible testifies of Christ. The whole book points to Christ. And Jesus goes on in verse 39, and he said, I mean, you see what Jesus is dealing with. With here, I mean, this whole ministry is dealing with a nation that is a religious order that's rejecting him and so on. But he says in verse 39, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Now, Moses prophesied of another prophet that would come speaking of Christ. And whosoever would not hearken to this prophet would be a cannibal at the judgment. And in fact, in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him, and it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. So you reject this prophet, you're rejecting eternal life. Okay, verse 40, going back to John 40, 540. And you will not come to me that you might have life. So Israel as a nation rejects the prince of life. I receive not honor from men. But I know you, that ye have not the love of God in you. It was because the religious leaders wanted the praise of men more than the approval of God. That's what they were after. They wanted the acclaim of the audience. 
John 5, 43. And here's a very important verse here because this is uh, kind of forecasting of one who would come talking about the Antichrist and they would receive him. John 5, 43, Jesus said, I am come in my father's name and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye shall receive. So, again, Jesus is alluding to the Antichrist. Another will come in his own name. Now, the Antichrist, which is to come, is a figure from the past. And he comes in his own name. And Israel will receive him. They receive the false Christ and the false prophet. And unfortunately, they reject the two witnesses that come down from above. At the same time, there's two that come down from heaven, two that come up from beneath. And it seems as though Israel uh, gravitates to the wrong two. They are supposed to be following Moses and Elijah, but they seem to gravitate to the Antichrist and the false prophet. But that's been their pattern anyway. Well, let's go on to verse 44. How can ye believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? So again, religious leaders wanted their applause of men, want people to clap after everything that they say and so on. If we want to be honored by men, if we want our applause from men, then God cannot use us. Or if he does, then the applause of men is our reward. Verse 45. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. For had you believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? So Israel rejected the word of Moses in Deuteronomy 18.18. 18, and they shall reject Moses himself when he comes as one of the two witnesses. Israel seems to reject the true prophet. Very sad. Okay, we are now in chapter 6 of John's Gospel. And in chapter 6, Christ performs a few more miracles. However, the main focus is upon the feeding of the 5,000. As we have previously stated... Christ fulfilled all of the symbols and types of the tabernacle. So in this chapter, we're going to see Christ fulfilling the table of showbread. Christ reveals himself as the bread of life, the bread that came down from heaven. Those who feed upon this bread shall live forever. Okay, let's begin at verse one. And... After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is in the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. Now, this is another interesting study. When you consider the intent for which various groups followed Christ, we can find three groups which relate to the triune man body, soul, and spirit. So we see one group that is following for the bread and fishes, the physical man, for their stomach. We see another group which is following for the sensational, the emotional eye, the soulish man. And then we see another group following for the living word, the spiritual man. Okay, in verse 2, 
Verse 2 relates to the soulish man. They were following because they saw the miracles. There were people who follow for the sensational. But when the phenomenon is gone, they are, they're gone as well. And you could actually put down a, a cross reference if you'd like to from Amos 4, verse 7 8. And these are the kind of people that just go from one place to another seeking for the sensational. But when the sensational is gone, then they're gone too. And we've known people like this kept relocating to follow a certain ministry. And then finally, the ministry dud it out. In verse 3, and Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. When a man of God really has something, the people will be seeking for him. That was the story of John the Baptist. They were going out to seek him. We also find in other passages where Jesus and his disciples were looking for a place of solace, a place of rest. They are in fact, looking for an escape. But in this passage, Jesus and his disciples had withdrawn. In verse 4, And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. Now, this would be the third Passover mentioned during Jesus' ministry. In verse 5, when Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him for himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that everyone may take a little. Well, 200 penny worth on today's scale at least in the U.S. dollar, of course, the U.S. dollar is changing, but would be about $38,000. Uh, a penny was a day's wage at the time. Now, one of his disciples, verse 8, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There's a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they uh, among so many? And Jesus said, make the men sit down. Now, there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down and number about 5,000. Now, in other gospels, <clears throat> they were seated in ranks by hundreds and fifties. And you could note Mark 640. And actually 5,000 is the number of the outer court. The outer court was 50 by 100, 5,000 square uh, cubits in that situation. In verse 11, and Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. So Jesus sets a pattern here for giving thanks for the food. Not only is this an act of gratitude, but it also releases a blessing upon the provision. And also take note that it was the disciples who served. Jesus said, I did not come to be ministered unto, but to minister. As ministers, we're here to serve others or not to be served, not to be ministered to. That's not our purpose. In verse 12, when they were filled, he said unto his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Notice, they could eat as much as they wanted, and there were leftovers. Now, spiritually, 
we could apply this to the sermon that is often that is being preached. Oftentimes, we miss certain points, or certain truths that, which can only be picked up as we later reflect upon the message. Let nothing be lost. You know, we want to pay attention to what God is speaking through the pulpit, through the minister, through others. In verse 13, Therefore they gathered them together and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. So the 12 baskets could spiritually apply to the 12 tribes. Christ had the power to feed the whole nation spiritually. And indeed, the bread that he gives could sustain the whole world. Now let's consider for a moment the symbolism of the showbread table in the tabernacle. Remember, Christ spiritually is going to fulfill all of the tabernacle furniture. He's going to reflect all of these, all that these pieces of furniture uh, were there for. So on the showbread table, there were 12 cakes of bread upon this table, and they symbolized the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, God's ultimate purpose for his people was that they would become bread to the nations. Actually, this is still God's purpose for us. God wants our lives to be bread to those around us. It says of Christ, the word became flesh. As we feed upon the word of God, it becomes a part of our spiritual anatomy. As we feed upon this word, it becomes a part of us. Our natural man needs to be fed, but so does our spiritual man. And as pastors, we need to feed the various groups within our church. Remember, they were seated in companies. There are little children, young men, and fathers. So we must have the ability to feed all of these groups in the message that we preach. Okay, let's go on to verse 14. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth that prophet that should come into the world. Again, alluding to Deuteronomy 18. Verse 15, when Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. Jesus had now separated from his disciples and his disciples, as he instructed, took shipping to cross over the sea. Now, you really have to incorporate the other Gospels to get the full picture here. Anyway, going on in verse 16, it says, uh, And when even was now come, his disciples went down into the ship. They entered into a ship and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was now dark, and Jesus was not come to them. And the sea arose by reason of great wind that it blew. So when they had rowed about five and 20 or 30 furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the water and drawing nigh unto the ship. And they were afraid. <clears throat> Pardon me. The disciples were about three or four miles out into the Sea of Galilee. And in Mark's gospel, it says that they were toiling in rowing. So they were having a, they were rowing against the current. The waves were against them here. And Jesus saw their plight and 
he saw them in the spirit, and so he walked out to where they were. Remember, it was night. It's in the middle of the lake. And when the disciples saw him, they were afraid. Verse 20. But he saith unto them, It is I, be not afraid. Then they willingly received him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at land, whither they went. Now, I think this scenario gives us a picture of the rest that God wants us to experience. The disciples were commissioned to cross the lake, and they were putting forth a lot of effort to get there. But when Jesus came on the scene, they were immediately there. This is the rest. When God is doing it, there's no sweat. Verse 22, the day following when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none other boat there save that one wherein his disciples were entered and that Jesus went not with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone. Dropping down to verse 25. I mean, they were wondering how Jesus got over there. That's the thing. Verse 25, and when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? And he, they saw his disciples leave without him across the sea. And, uh, you know, how did Jesus get to the other side of Galilee? So they were quite amazed about this. And there were none other boats except for the ones that had come in. So they were saying, Rabbi, how did you get here? In verse 26, uh, Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, You seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Now, here's a group that sought Jesus for the bread and fishes. Here's the prosperity crowd but Jesus avoids their question and by saying in verse 27 labor not for the meat which perisheth but for the meat which endureth unto eternal life which the son of man shall give unto you for him hath God the father sealed See, the world labors for the things that are temporal, things that pass away. Those who seek the kingdom of God have eternal life, plus all the things they need are added, that are needed are added as well. You know, we want to hunger for the right thing. You know, Job hungered for the spiritual food. In fact, let me just quote from Job for a minute. Job 23, 12. And Job is saying, Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Here's the real food. Okay. John 6, 28. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. So, it is Christ who does the mighty works. Our part is simply to believe. And Christ can work through those who simply believe. That's the work. That's our work, to believe. Verse 30. They said, therefore, unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What doest thou, uh, what dost thou work? Very strange question here. For those who had just witnessed 5,000 people being fed from one basket. You know, it says in John 5.37, 
that though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. He had done all of these miracles and still they did not believe. Well, anyway, the crowd responds in verse 31, John 6, 31. Well, our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth unto life unto the world. Of course, Jesus is referring, revealing himself as the bread of life. And interestingly, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, which means the house of bread. So the bread of life came out of the house of bread. And in the tabernacle scenario, the bread was to be continually on the table. Now, once again, the Jews could never distinguish between the natural and the spiritual. They read everything with the natural mind and with the natural understanding. Verse 34. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore, give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. Actually, there are seven I am's in the book of John. And here's one of them. I am the bread of life. Remember that Christ revealed himself to Moses as the I am. Well, here's one of the I am's right here. I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. And when you think about this, Christ literally fed thousands with leftovers beside Spiritually, there are millions of believers today. They all, all draw their sustenance from one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. We live, we, we draw our strength, we're energized through the life of one man. There are 500 million, and I say 500 million born again believers today that all pray through one person and that one person hears every prayer at the same time. Amen. Okay, we're going to end here and take a break and we won't see you until the next class. And so God bless you and have a good evening.